uh, very pleased to welcome you all to today's discussion about the uh, vital role that AI and other tech innovation will play in Scotland's future. And uh, we're delighted to have two outstanding individuals who are at the heart of ensuring that happens as our guests. Uh, I'll start with Dr. George Baxter, who has been Chief Executive of Edinburgh Innovations since 2016. Uh, Edinburgh Innovations, for those of you that don't know, is the University of Edinburgh's commercialisation service and leads the university's activities in industry engagement and business development, enterprise support and the identification, management and commercialisation of university intellectual property. And yes, I did read that off the screen. Um, <laughs> it, it also helps commercial organizations build innovative ideas using the right technologies, expertise and facilities at the university. Bit of background on George, he spent 15 years at ICI and then at AstraZeneca running a number of international businesses. He then joined the Northwest Development Agency as Director of Science and Innovation and over the next eight years the agency led a number of major economic development initiatives including the Daresbury Science and Innovation Campus, the formation of the N8 group of universities and the innovation strategy for the northwest of England. Uh, he's also worked as Professor of Innovation and Enterprise at Salford University and led the University of Nottingham's Directorate of Business Engagement. Uh, our other guest is Jarmo Eskelainen. Uh, Jarmo is Executive Director of the £660 million data-driven innovation programme uh, which forms a large and crucial part of Edinburgh's city region and with which the university is, is closely involved. Uh, Jarmo joined from Future Cities Catapult in London with his Chief Innovation and Technology Officer. He led its research and innovation strategy and academic collaboration. Before joining Catapult, Jarmo was the CEO of Forum Virium Helsinki. I think I've got that right, Jarmo. Uh, uh, the innovation Indeed. lab of the city of Helsinki in Finland. So two quite different perspectives from uh, from two people who are nevertheless working in sync at the moment. Um, just a, a, a bit of background. Edinburgh claims it's the data capital of, of Europe and, and the Edinburgh uh, University of Edinburgh is the leading university in Britain for AI, as well as a founding member of the Turing Institute. These are incredible assets, but they need the right framework to become greater than the sum of their parts. Uh, we'd also like to see other regions of Scotland and other universities learn from the Edinburgh experience and, and spread that expertise and opportunity across the country. Universities, as we all know, must play a central role in a thriving innovation ecosystem. They are the engines of research and innovation, working on how to solve the modern world's problems. This was something emphasised in the recent law review of Scotland's tech ecosystem for the Scottish Government. So among the issues we'll explore today are uh, what we can learn from the best examples of innovation ecosystems around the world, such as in Helsinki and Boston, another often quoted place. How do you provide the right environments uh, and support for innovators and entrepreneurs? What particular strengths can Edinburgh's role in the city region deal bring to its position as a centre of innovation? And how can the, those lessons be more widely shared? What are the challenges and barriers Scotland faces in areas such as skills development, polarisation of jobs and employment opportunities, mobility issues, that kind of thing. And I guess as we emerge from lockdown and, and COVID, there will be a fresh set of economic challenges. So how can innovation support the recovery uh, and the kind of economy we should seek to, to build? So um, again, I'll just say housekeeping, please mute yourself unless you're asked to speak so we avoid background noise. And the other th important thing is that we're very keen this is a conversation. Uh, so if you send us some questions, you'll see the gizmo uh, for messaging on your Zoom app uh, and just send questions as and when you have them. And after I've been through a bit of a Q&A with the guys, then uh, we'll open up to questions from the floor. So if you can send your questions in advance, I know uh, what you're asking and, and which ones to select, etc. So, George, um, I thought we might start with you. Um, so big boasts about Edinburgh, the data centre of Europe, Edinburgh University, AI capital. Um, where would you, is that, is that a fair summation of Edinburgh's place in the global tech charts or, or, or is it a bit more complicated than that? No, I, th I think it's actually a fair summation. I mean, if you look at the history of AI Edinburgh, we've had one of the leading schools. In fact, I think we were about the second school that ever formed uh, after Stanford, if I get my history right. Um, we have one of the largest and most successful schools uh, informatics in the country. In fact, in the last research excellence framework uh, we came top. So that's assessment by the peer group of academics as well. Um, in terms of the city, you know, if you go back 15, 20 years, we had a handful of data-driven companies around the city. Uh, at the last count, we have well over 120. 
Um, as Edinburgh Innovations, uh, we, we help our students and our staff form companies. We, form, we help form around 100 companies a year, and quite a large minority of those companies are data-driven. So uh, we're not quite up to the, I think in the tech cluster, you know, we're not there at Stanford or, or Boston yet, but those are the ambitions that we have for the city, for the university and for the city, uh, which is why, you know, the, the city deal that YAML leads on is, is so important. Mm. Uh, and Yamo, that, that's a useful moment for you to come in. So you've come from outside Scotland, you've come from Helsinki, which is held up as one of the real uh, global success stories. So, you know, we Scots like to talk ourselves up. What's your more rational outsider's take on the reality of Scotland's position and, and where we're strong and maybe where we're less strong and need to do some work? Oh, I think, I think you're muted. You're muted, Yamo. Indeed, I, I'm muted because I was asked to. <laughs> so one of the uh, one of the things which is very clear when uh, coming to Scotland from the uh, from elsewhere is that the uh, it's just in the regarding the workplace of for me, me my, mine and George's uh, the universities universities in general is a real 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 uh, asset. I mean, we are Scotland is 5.5 million people and uh, very very strong in universities uh, for a nation of that. Nice. So that's uh, that's kind of quite unique uh, uh, in in Europe uh, when you when you think of when you think about it. Uh, so that's that's an asset. Uh, then it's also also clear that the uh, uh, connection between the universities and the and the industry isn't in all sectors as strong as it potentially could be and that's something which we could build on and uh, George's Edinburgh Innovations has been uh, has been uh, carrying the torch on that domain very successfully in the uh, in the recent recent years uh, but that's definitely a domain which which we should we should, we should be become better at and a bit in a Finnish fashion uh, Scots uh, uh, are not maybe the most uh, best in uh, promoting themselves I'm not sure if the uh, we want to be the data capital of Europe, but uh, probably at the moment uh, Edinburgh is the data capital of Scotland. Uh, I doubt if anybody from Italy or Germany would name the uh, Edinburgh as one of the leading cities in this domain, even though it actually factually factually is a, it's a very very strong strong uh, background in data which spans back for decades, and that's the uh, that's the thing we just we need to get the word out there so that we get the investments, the companies, the talent to come. To Scotland, you know, it's most we are, we are a small place. We want to get uh, good people from elsewhere. We want to get money and companies from elsewhere to join us. Mm. And I, I wonder if you could um, maybe both of you explain how your two organisations work in sync. So, what, what, how does EI fit with DDI and, and vice versa? Um, and how does that work in practice? Okay. What, yeah, George, do you yeah. want? To... Okay, okay, cool. so so we look after responsible for the, all of the university stuff that you very succinctly. Uh, summarize there, Chris. Um, so, but particularly with Yarmo and the team and data-driven innovation, what we tend to focus on is the, the entrepreneurship uh, part of it. We use the acronym TRADE, which is an ACE you want to remember, uh, teaching, research, um, adoption, data sets, and, and entrepreneurship. So we get um, our talent, rather than, rather than teaching talent, um, so E for entrepreneurship, which means that uh, we, look, we look after um, and we try and pull together all of the university's uh, activities and entrepreneurship and, and company formation, as well as venture capital. So we are building up a lot of relationships with venture capital. So I think Yarmo, ha Yarmo can explain, but he has the responsibility for the whole thing. We tend to focus with the DDI team on all, on all those, but predominantly on the entrepreneurship. Mm. Yes, so the... Uh... DDI, after two and a half years, we are still in the, uh, I would say, ramp up phase. So eventually, over the timeline of 15 years, during the first years in which we are now, there's a significant investment part. So the uh, we are establishing five innovation hubs, of which the first, the base center, is now up and running. Uh, and then there's uh, construction sites on different phases of uh, completion which we are, we are building. The Edinburgh International Data Facility, which is kind of a sixth hub, will be the home base for the uh, data capacity connecting these five new innovation locations together. And, uh, and we are about halfway through that, that ramp up phase when it comes for the investment program. But then on top of the investment program, what we, made, what we have promised is that, hey, 
provide us funding to build these fantastic new physical and data assets. And then we'll focus on uh, working together with 10 industry sectors, uh, ranging from fintech financial services to creative industries, tourism and festivals, to uh, boost their ability to innovate with data and reform, reform the way they do business and, uh, and uh, manage the, uh, their operations through, through data. And that's uh, currently, we have six major anchor projects going on in different domains. The uh, largest ones, for example, the Global Open Finance Center of Excellence uh, is in the range of 50 million pounds. So we are quite well on track uh, in ramping these operations up. But we are at the uh, interface uh, both with both the uh, physical locations and then with, with, the, uh, with the academics. So we deal with all these aspects of, of trade, uh, including talent, teaching new data scientists uh, and in ensuring those data assets available. Mm. And I, I, I wonder if you could maybe explain to those of us who are not expert in, in this area, um, where are we likely to see visible impact? So for example, healthcare is something that you hear a lot about AI having a, a, an impact on monitoring uh, people's health, you know, visible, uh, wearable tech, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, but, so there's that, maybe that's something you could talk about, uh, but also then other aspects of, of uh, AI and, and tech development that will actually have an impact on the way we work and the way we live and um, where you see Scotland uh, leading on that. Yeah, I, I can give you uh, two quick examples, one from the past, one that we're currently working on. So uh, diabetes is a big issue in the developed world, um, significant impact on amputations and, and blindness, actually. Um, and it was one of the first examples where AI was applied to the treatment of diabetes, where in Scotland, because we've got this really fantastic medical record system that covers the whole of the country, um, the, the academics working it, there's a lot of collaboration across the whole of Scotland, looked at all the, the diabetes treatment records, looked at the treatment methods using AI, and, and, and then we were able to then change treatment methods uh, doing that in a way that w which individual um, medics couldn't do, you know, you wouldn't be able, no one would be able to scan all of those uh, and look for patterns. Uh, that led to significant reduction in amputations and blindness in uh, diabetes and diabetics in Scotland, something like 30 40 percent over five years, quite dramatic uh, reduction. A very practical one from the current day is uh, we signed an agreement with Legal in General last year. Uh, they're investing 20 million pounds into research at the University of Edinburgh, uh, and that's around I think called the Advanced Care Research Centre, uh, which I was very uh, pleased to be involved with, uh, helped setting up. Um, now that's a, that's a broad collaboration across the whole university, everything from social care through to robotics, AI and so on. But one of the very practical things there is, you talked about wearable tech, Chris. Now, if you've got wearable tech and you're trying to help people stay in their home for, for longer, which is one of the objectives of this, um, then how do you differentiate between someone who's just like falling asleep in the chair watching the, the football or someone who's actually ill uh, and who's actually needs help? And if you talk to if you talk to our professor of general practice, Bruce Guthrie, he will say, you know, if, if you just relied on GPs monitoring or uh, whatever and monitoring that sort of wearable tech, there would be so many false alarms, it would overwhelm the health service. So what you need to do is have some really smart AI that can tell the difference between someone who's who's you know fallen over or someone who's actually just going to lay down in bed for a couple of hours. So it's um, so that's one from history and one from the more practical, real world projects that we're running just now with with big industrial partners. Mm, that's that's mm -hmm. fascinating. And Yano, you mentioned um, financial data and uh, training that you're doing, etc. Could you talk a bit more about how that will play a role? I could uh, pick two very recent and very very uh, timely examples. The uh, so the Global Open Finance Center of Excellence is a large five year initiative, which uh, aims to develop as it as it as it says on the tin, a uh, global hub for innovating with open financial data. Basically, data we all produce when we you know manage money, uh, and how we can both get better transparency and visibility for that as individuals, but also how can companies uh, benefit from uh, more transparent flows of that data. 
But the uh, concrete project which uh, Gofco uh, Center has done now uh, at the time of the uh, pandemic is that they have collaborated with the uh, UK government treasury uh, and the uh, NatWest to develop uh, with a qu in, at quite tight timelines. Uh, after last spring, they ramped up a data service uh, based on the uh, actual uh, data feeds of uh, finance data from NatWest to set up a financial observatory of the impact of the pandemic to the national economy. And they've been then providing data insights for the, uh, for the, for the uh, financial institute, institution and the, and the treasury, you know, kind of a real-time real monitoring of what, what's actually happening uh, to the pulse of the nation with the financial data. Uh, uh, fair to say, uh, it's also showed how difficult it is to share data in this domain, so it took a while to wrap up, but they have been able to provide valuable insights, which otherwise would have been, again, impossible to find these trends if you just look at the statistics manually. Uh, another other example from the uh, domain of uh, healthcare, the, uh, we, ha we have a collaboration with NHS, which is called NHS Data Log. We are pulling the NHS East Lothian data into a machine learning capable uh, data environment at the Usher Institute. And there, the same thing in that domain. Uh, our plans had been to be in the, be in the production mode with the, with the data log in 2022, uh, maybe 21. But because of the pandemic, uh, the clinicians and uh, NHS decided that they ramp up the speed significantly and they set up a data COVID-19 data collaborative uh, and uh, managed to basically in integrate and merge uh, the data of all patients uh, diagnosed or tested for COVID in the region, uh, connected to their previous health data. And that's make, making it possible as we speak to, for example, study more personalized recovery care pay pathways for patients who recover, to study the uh, what 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 what's actually long COVID, what's what kind of a con other previous con uh, for example conditions are potentially linked to to, to long COVID as a, as a phenomena we understand quite little of, mm -hmm. uh, and and connected to social care data, how can we improve the use and impact of community mental health services? It's absolutely fascinating and interesting to hear about real world uh, impact of, of this stuff. I suppose, you know, we live in a world now where data is everywhere and, uh, you know, uh, it drives an awful lot of what we're doing. And this spillover into public policy as well. You mentioned the Treasury getting access to this kind of thing. How do you draw the line between data dictating policy and being used to inform policy, if you, if you see what I mean, that it has an influence, but it doesn't decide policy. Oh, George, are you muted? I think you might be. I've been, I've You're been muted, George. Going. Your yeah. turn. You don't have to mute yourself. <laughs> no, no, I don't, I don't have to mute myself, no. Uh, yes, I, I'm sure some of my colleagues would prefer I did sometimes. Um, <laughs> we've, uh, we, it's actually really important this, uh, and in fact, um, we, we've appointed, I think Jan Wolfram Wright, the, the first professor of data ethics in, uh, in the UK. Yeah. So uh, with, with a very generous gift uh, donation from uh, Billy Gifford. So we've got a professor of data ethics looking at exactly those sort of issues. How do you use the data? What does it get used for? Um, we are, we're very much interested in uh, you know, using the data, producing the data, producing the insights. What's done with that then is then for the policy people and for the politicians. You know, I, I think we, we sort of stop uh, at that point. I mean, some of, my, some of our academic colleagues uh, are, are a member of, you know, government advisory panels and so on. You know, Professor Debbie Schrader, who's very well known. Now Linda Ball, Professor Linda Bald as well. But um, for us, uh, at, at the more technical end, it's about um, producing the information, producing the data, and then handing over to the politicians and saying, or the policymakers and saying, Here, here's what the data shows. Now you've got to interpret it and put the policies in place to make the best use of it. Mm. And, and, and uh, mm. on, on ethics, oh, go on, yeah, I'm on. I could build on that the. Uh... Please carry on. So the. Uh... Uh, the professor, which George mentioned, Shannon Volor, her uh, I like her thinking in the uh, in the in that she builds a connection between technical excellence and ethical excellence. Basically, she's saying that poor products tend to be poor in all aspects. Uh, they are technically bad, but they are also ethically ethically lousy. 
and uh, and if uh, if we implement a sort of pro proper ethical ethical uh, uh, approach to development of development of products and services, everything is better. They work work better uh, for both the uh, the providers of services and users. The, uh, but it's indeed true that data scientists only provide insights from the data they have, and they can't provide insights of the data they don't have, and they are they never intended to. So the uh, Google's uh, chief decision scientist, Kazi Kozurkov, she talks about. Uh, I mean, her title is chief decision scientist, and she talks about the uh, importance to understand that data engineering, meaning you know which data do we have and how do we make it available. Data science, which is working with the data we happen to have, and then statistics and policy making, all has to be part of the equation. Uh, we have to understand on which grounds we are we are we are making the. Our, our assumptions mm -hmm. and of course the uh, there's lots lots of discussion uh, which we has which is keeps on being had about the uh, bias hidden bias in data because we have collected data on certain based on certain assumptions and uh, and it's uh, there can can be sort of an internal echo chamber effects within data sets which yeah. which uh, will go unnoticed under, unless we pay attention to getting that right i've, I've been reading uh and actually, just last night I was reading a, a very interesting paper about that, about the use of machine learning and, uh, and, and interpreting occupations and where men and women are occupied and uh, showing significant evidence of bias in some of these, uh, which, which put people into different occupations depending whether they're male or female, um, which actually don't match up with the reality of where people, even, even with the reality of where people are in those occupations. So um, it, it's actually a really interesting point, just why you know the university was really keen to to make that appointment of the first professor of data ethics. Uh, it's really important. Um, if you can imagine as well, when you're recruiting people now, a lot of companies use AI to read applications. So it was something that sort of scared me a little bit. You know, if someone gets 300 applicants for a job, they just get an AI to look at it and see who's got the best fit for the uh, the advert. And then that the AI puts forward the next, you know, the, the next layer of, of interviewees. So um, this is a really uh, fertile ground for, for research. Um, and the university, I think we, mm. we're at the forefront of that now. Yeah, because there has been, um, yeah, I've heard before people talking about worries about gender or sex or whatever we're calling it these yeah, days. Yeah. And, and that, you know, if you, I mean, I don't know whether you'd still think that the world of uh, technology is still quite male dominated in terms of a lot of, the, a lot of the people who work in it and whether therefore the algorithms that are being designed have inbuilt flaws based on the biases of those that are constructing them. That, that, that's the issue. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, Jan, when I just mentioned four people, all women. I... <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's, no, you're right. It needs to be looked at because I think that's where the paper last night I was reading was demonstrating Mm -hmm. there, there can be inbuilt biases and you need to be able to uh, ensure that doesn't happen uh, or at least understand that that is happening. Yeah, Armo, did you have something to add there? Or? I think that's especially vital in... Uh, I think the, uh, the, uh, that topic is also important from the uh, viewpoint of the uh, challenges and opportunities for, for Scotland. Uh, as said, this is a small place, so what we shouldn't do is to, is to waste talent. That's one of the learnings maybe from uh, Nordic countries or my home country, Finland, uh, which, which is the, the Nordic's, Nordic uh, welfare state model, uh, which is being blamed for being socialist or whatever, is often misunderstood to be kind of uh, caring, but actually it's selfish. It's built to, uh, to increase efficiency of a small nation so that everybody can who has capacity can maximize the use of the capacity because that makes sense from the point of view of national economy that's women uh, i mean there's free childcare because after the world war 2 such, such, such so many men had died that you had to had to get the ladies to the factories mm -hmm. so it was actually quite a, quite a Quite a uh, economical fiscal decision, which was made, which was made back in the day, but it it's proven to make sense, uh, regardless of your background, your your uh, ethnicity, your where you come from. You should be able to make it if you if you if you have the talent, mm -hmm. especially in a small place. You know, we 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 don't have any extra meat for a meat grinder model. If you want to use such a brutal expression, uh, <laughs> we should we should uh, ensure that uh, bright bright minds. 
uh, get get the opportunity. I think that's a really important uh, bit there about you know our comparisons. We are working with the University of Helsinki for for some uh, very obvious reasons. They're really expert on the student entrepreneurship, but I think they're they're learning from us on some other areas of innovation. But what, what's fascinating me about, about Finland and having f friends who are Finnish as well and working with Yarmo and so on is this focus on human capital. We you know, use that horrible phrase, you know, that it, the, res the key resource is a cliche, but the key resource of any country is its people. And, and, and uh, for a country like Finland, I mean, you can joke, Finland's got wood and it's got people, you know, and wood is really, really important for its products. Um, but, you know, you compare it to Scotland and Scotland's got quite a lot of other advantages over Finland, you know, we should be able to be really successful. Um, but this focus on, on human, human uh, resources is, is absolutely critical, which is why the talent part of uh, data-driven innovation is really important. And, and it's why a lot of companies want to come and base themselves in Edinburgh because we produce some of the world's best uh, data science graduates every year from mm. one of the from, from one of the biggest schools. And, and, and there is obviously, um, you know, from a, the perspective of people who are working in the industry, you know, great enthusiasm to, to, to full steam ahead. Let's see where we can get to. There might be the other side of it, which is the public view that they're a bit nervous about their data being used and gathered in, in certain ways. I remember speaking to someone at the Scottish government a year or so ago, and I was just talking to them about um, the idea of identity cards or whatever, some form of, that you would have your healthcare data and various things that you kind of, I think there's Finland quite far ahead on that kind of thing as well, certainly Estonia and places like that. And um, they said to me, well, we, we actually polled it and we found that uh, people were much happier for Tesco to have their data than they were for the government <laughs> to have their data. So there's obviously <laughs> some distrust of the state, which may be quite a British thing, but... Um, <laughs> It's uh, there's 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 probably good historical reasons for the uh, being a bit <laughs> suspicious of governments because Tesco normally I don't think they have killed people but quite a few governments have <laughs> so there are histor historical reasons for the uh, uh, for that uh, yeah yeah but fair enough it's uh, trust is a key issue there and uh, and the uh, What's interesting about the uh, building trust is that I think the things we what we need to be able to provide is more than legislation, because you can't kind of use laws uh, as a, in your daily life. What we should have is better ways to manage our identity. Where where is our data being kept? How can I manage that? How can I see that? Uh, how can I uh, manage uh, kind of have a conscious approach of managing consent between different different services so that it would be not just ticking the box after 500 pages of text which you never read uh, but but more toolbox like approach and i think there's a significant opportunity for new business in that in providing trusted services and providing trust services for companies who provide services because that's not probably not the core operation for most companies there could be companies who actually do do that for other companies including the uh, the government because governments repeatedly have uh, have sucked at managing our data as well uh, it's an, no wonder it's a complex task and uh, and it's easy to get it wrong uh, and uh, and we are basically in a way have fighting a losing game because the uh, the, the 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 hackers and the and the crackers of the world uh, are doing their best to to you know put our systems on their knees and they are they are good at that so there has to be conscious ongoing uh, and i would say more orchestrated effort to understand how critical it is to to keep us us safe and provide us tools to keep ourselves safe I always think it's funny when my friends say, oh, I, I don't want my data to go anywhere. As they log on to Facebook, Twitter and Pinterest, um, it's, uh, you know, the, everybody, we all share data. We don't even really know we're doing it. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, we'll make a good, good point there. Yeah. Uh, we, we, somehow we seem to trust these private sector run organizations more than we trust our own elected governments. Indeed. Um, so just, <laughs> <laughs> just mo moving on a bit then, um, <laughs> Edinburgh has, has raced ahead of the rest of, of Scotland in, in this area and I'm interested as to why that is. Is it in part because the data, were the, did the data scientists come first or did the ambition to create the data scientists come first and how did we get from what you were talking about at the start, George, about the early days yeah. and the ambitions to, to where we are now? I, I actually have to say, you know, um, I arrived in Edinburgh four and a half years ago, despite the accent, I lived in England for 30 years, 
so I never never lost it. Um, but so I arrived just as we were going through the bidding process for the the uh, city deal uh, funding, and it was fascinating because what you had there and a really good example of several people having the vision to to see what was there in Edinburgh and to connect it to the political dots, which were the the bits about the city deal that we're going to put ahead. So and and having the, the courage to actually go to the city and say, look, if, if we're doing a city deal with um, with the UK government and the Scottish government, what, why don't we make this something which is really unique in the UK? Why We don't want to just go for the usual one around health, bridges, roads, that sort of stuff. Let's go for something which is based around what we're really good at. Now, we've got the world's third best mm. uh, AI school, third, third best informatics school. Uh, we've been here for nearly 500 years as a university. We're, we're, a, we're a billion pounds organisation, turnover, 15,000 staff, you know, we're one of the biggest employers in the country. Why don't you base the city deal around the strengths of the University of Edinburgh, a world top 20 research university? And, and what was fun, so, so the people in, in, in the university at that point, uh, Charlie Jeffrey, Jonathan Seckle, Gu Edmiston, Kevin Collins, probably those four people together uh, said, let's pull together uh, a proposal that we can take, which makes sense to the Scottish and UK governments and make a bid for, you know, 230 million pounds to be invested in this, uh, as this unique city deal. Um, and I think it was a good enough vision that it carried the day. And, and I still remember on the day when there was Nicola Sturgeon and Theresa May who turned up to sign the deal at the university. And, and it wasn't often you get those two in a, in a room together. And um, they, they sat very happily down at the table because this is completely non-political. This is all about, you know, the benefit of, of everyone. Um, so, so the way it was done in Edinburgh was there was a small group of people at the university who had the vision and the courage to try and, and push it through, supported by the city and the, you know, the politicians in the city yeah. and in Scotland. Um, and it tied into what the UK government and the Scottish government were trying to do at the same time on economic growth. And, and particularly around the, the Scottish, particularly around the Scottish government vision on, on social um, inclusion as well. Is that mm. really important? Part of I think though the uh... George, I think the uh, probably there was. Uh, I, I do recall that the, the at the uh, at the day of the uh, signing of the paper, Adam McWay from the uh, uh, City of Edinburgh Council had a job of standing with the two ladies all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I did notice that in the photograph. But I'm sure that was just. They, they were never, never. They were never actually side by side. There was always Adam McWay in the in between. That's I've been told that. So I'm not sure. We did organise a meeting at the university, so they had they had an hour just to tell them together at the university as well. So. I think, from what I've heard from the first minister, those weren't our favourite meetings. About the, uh, you can imagine. Yeah, from the uh, still from the, uh, I think the trick with uh, the trick with the uh, DDI is the uh, is the connection of the uh, very forward looking ambition, and then. That's coupled tightly to the, uh, the sort of a building on the shoulders of giants. So it's coupled with existing expertise. So we are not in no sector, no domain are we starting from scratch, which means that we can, you know, we don't have to learn to build a bicycle to, to bike. We actually do have a do have a bicycle. It's uh, we, we just become faster riders. Uh, and the, uh, for example, the uh, Edinburgh International Data Facility, which is at the heart of DDI as the uh, data crunching storage capacity, and which is just uh, in the process of uh, purchasing the uh, Cerebras computer, which is the uh, fastest in the world for two weeks or something, probably. But anyway, uh, it's going to be a very fast, fast, fast computer. Uh, EPCC, Edinburgh Parallel Computing Centre, has a legacy of, of uh, being uh, at the heart of the UK's data ecosystem. The National Data Safety Haven has been hosted there for years. It's been hosting the uh, large chunk of UK supercomputing capacity before the EDI program. And now with the EDI, we can you know take it up to 11 uh, with the spinal tap terms. <laughs> Well, inter interesting that you talk about uh, you had the you had the bicycle, if you like, so you could you could build on on that. And a lot of what we hear is Edinburgh so far ahead of the, the the rest of Scotland, perhaps Edinburgh Uni ahead of other universities on on this kind of thing. And the question is, are we talking about other 
areas of Scotland, other institutions playing catch up, or should they be trying to do their own specific thing? Should they be looking to see if they don't have a bike, they've got a, a dump truck, or they've got a you know a microwave oven, or, or whatever it is? And and how do you direct then the energy and the finance across Scotland, maybe to diversify a bit, or or, or should we be chucking more eggs into this basket and making a national specialism in, in data? What would your thoughts be on that? Well, I. Oh, that's a that's a good one. Uh, yeah, Yamo, do you want to go first? Uh, well, I I can give it a go first, and then you can see. Let's see if we agree. I I would say the uh, uh, DDI driving data driven innovation in Scotland is a long term game. I mean, even the DDI program is a long term long term promise. Ten years of delivery and five years of follow up. Uh, and uh, and interesting about that is that of course we don't really know where technology is going. Uh, we we can make guesses a couple of years ahead, but uh, but five years from now there's going to be new tech which we haven't seen yet, and that makes it makes it exciting. And that's something we need to be uh, ready to ready to uh, capitalize on. The uh, so definitely we must keep on building on this but i think where the real opportunity is the, uh, is in the connections of different strength sectors of scotland and data because any all the areas are being disrupted by digital and data driven innovation regardless of the uh, how old and uh, prosperous an industry is or, or business sector is it's going to be changed and that's that's i think where the uh, there's lots of space for local uh, Local uh, implementations and lo local local vari variants of this. Yeah, I, I, I got a general point of view from my experience of working. I did eight years in economic development, as you mentioned, in the, the northwest of England, uh, very similar to sort of Scottish sort of Scottish enterprise role. Um, it, it, it's clear, you know, in the northwest or in Scotland, you know, we're, we're not big enough to do everything for everybody to do everything. You know, as Yarmo said, there are specialisations. And, and we see data as the underpinning part of that. So of course we see ourselves as being leading in data. I mean, we could put up all sorts of numbers to justify that, but there are other bits of Scotland who are really expert in other things that we're you know, probably better than we are in some things. So what we need to do is, is be the data experts to bring those parts into the whole collective offering for the whole of Scotland uh, and work together on this. I think if we start trying to compete against each other on all these things, to, you know too much there's always a little bit of competition but you know it, the collective capability we've got three universities in the world top 100 as, you know as Yama said earlier for a small country of five and a half million people that's absolutely incredible um you know it, it, one of the best performances of small countries in the world so we need to use that um we've got real expertise across a whole range of areas sp spread around all the universities in scotland I say we lead in data, but let, and we can be the catalyst for bringing data to all those other sectors. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted. Indeed. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, the, the issues that the sector faces, uh, in terms of attracting talent, in terms of attracting investment, in terms of retaining talent and retaining companies here, what are the biggest challenges that somewhere like Edinburgh faces at the moment? Is it international competition? Is it certain restrictions around Brexit or that, that, that kind of thing? What, what are the, ch the immediate challenges in front of us? Well, it, I, I, can pick, I can pick them up in terms of venture capital. In fact, um, despite the lockdowns and COVID, everybody was predicting a year ago that there'd be, it'd be a disaster for venture capital in, in the world. In fact, it's not been. There's, if you look at all the data, there's been more venture capital investment in the last year around Europe than ever. It's been a record year, which actually surprised, I'm surprised me, surprised all of us, surprised all of the people who are taking the polls. Um, Scotland is doing quite well. Edinburgh's doing quite well. We had a record year last year for our spin-outs. So we had uh, 32 million of early stage investment into our spin-outs last year, which was a record and was about four times where we were five years ago. And we want to get that up to 100 million a year into early stage spin-outs. So um, we, we, we brought on board another uh, probably another 20 sources of venture capital into Scotland. But to pick up your issues, Chris, the issue in the past has been that most of the venture capital has been based around, you know, London, Oxford, Cambridge. It's been easy for people to do that. Um, one, of the, one of the only advantages, I think, of, of lockdown has been it's just as easy to have a conversation like this with someone who's coming from, you know, Boston than it is to for them to fly, you know, much easier than it is for them to fly into Oxford and then fly up to to Edinburgh. 
So we brought in a number of US-based venture capitalists in the last year that um, we, we mm. probably may not have done three or four years ago. Uh, we've been much more vocal about our strengths as well. Also, there was a little bit of maybe overheating in some of the other markets, which meant that value for money coming to Scotland was better. If you're you an investor, you can get a value for money for just as good signs coming to Scotland. So in fact, there's some good news. Uh, l last year was good for venture capital in Scotland. Uh, this year so far, we're, we're running almost, for the half, first half of the year, academic year, we're running at the same level we did for the whole of last year. So I think we're, we're going to easily smash the record for last year. So whatever mm -hmm. we're doing in terms of attracting people is right. And the other thing is we've got some massive advantages in Edinburgh in terms of livability. You know, it's a city that people actually want to come and work in. Um, but that's, you can't say that for, for, for all cities in the world. And, you know, it, it's, it's, I mean, I moved here myself four and a half years ago. Um, even though I'm from the West Coast, I, mean, I did make the great sacrifice and moved to Edinburgh. Um, and I was going to say Edinburgh's great, but it's not Glasgow, is it? No, no, it's great, but it's not, <laughs> it's not Balloch. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, you know, it's, it's, no, it's a great city to live in. Um, and, and actually, that's really important is when we talk to investors because they want to recruit and retain the best staff. And part of that is the, the living conditions. You know, can, can, you, can you get a good house? Is there good schooling? Uh, what's the geography like? Can they go out on the weekend and go hill walking, uh, sailing and all that sort of stuff? What's the cultural offering like? And if you look at back to this thing you said earlier on about Chris, about the great innovation ecocenters in the world, they've all got that downright, you know, Boston, uh, West Coast America, mm. um, you know, they've got that mix of, you know, in San Francisco of the financial, the, the uh, geographical, the cultural, which, um, yep. you know, you can aspire to. I could, uh, I have a completely unrelated uh, snippet, but I, or fact, but I thought of uh, sharing that because you mentioned the uh, getting people you wouldn't get in the room otherwise. So, uh, not linked to entrepreneurship, but just saying that there's an example of that coming up. So I'll make an announcement uh, uh, or advertisements for that. On the 2nd of March, uh, there's going to be a discussion about COVID's long-term impact as part of the DDI futures, uh, futures discussions. And uh, for the first time, we have uh, China, Africa and USA top experts discussing. Uh, there's a uh, leading uh, respiratory scientist uh, from from uh, from from China, Nashan Chong. Uh, there's uh, Sheila Chiu from uh, from Botswana and Anthony Fauci from the White House. So uh, we that's something we couldn't have done probably in real life, <laughs> uh, but can happen over Zoom. Uh, but then to the uh, uh, the uh, some of the things we we should focus on so i think one one of the uh, if if i go to the talent aspect so i think one of the things we should uh, pay attention to is the uh, how do we raise the uh, next generation sort of a re generation of future founders uh, in in scotland and how do we empower the uh, the people to be more entrepreneurial at the, whether they are at the university or just thinking about whether they will ever come to the university. And that's certainly a domain in which we could do better. So maybe Strathclyde and Glasgow, uh, Edinburgh tend to be quite good at a uh, student entrepreneurship, but not necessarily all the universities. And uh, even, I would say, even we are doing okay, there's still room to improve. And, uh, and in that domain, if I pull an example from my hometown, uh, previous hometown, Helsinki, there the, uh, the empowerment of the student uh, entrepreneurial societies uh, and the collaboration between companies and student societies around entrepreneurship have, for example, built the Slush event. It's still a student-run event, even though it's the largest startup event in the in, in Europe. It's run by a student-owned company nowadays, but still, student association owns it. So there's lots of power in the young people of Scotland uh, and in the student population, which come from everywhere which we should amplify and, and build, build oh, that's on. That's fascinating. I had, a, I had a really interesting experience. I did the MIT Entrepreneurial Development course a number of years ago, and, and we sat in, this for a couple of weeks, and we sat in with uh, students at MIT on their entrepreneurship training. It's, it's part of the core curriculum there. 
And I turned to the, the, the young student beside me and I said to her, well, what, what, why did you come to MIT? He said, well, I want to be a billionaire. You know, and, and, and I doubt that, I mean, that's just one random, one random paper, but I doubt if we looked at, we said to our students, why did you come mm -hmm. to Edinburgh? <laughs> we probably wouldn't get that type of response. But, but there, the, the sense of entrepreneurship is so ingrained. And I remember on, on, they had a cheese and wine thing for the Entrepreneurship Society at seven o'clock one night. And we all turned up, you know, at 10 to seven. They said, sorry, you can't get it. It's full. <laughs> and they had, they had 2,000 people in a hall that held like 700. It, it, it was just astonishing the levels of engagement that you had in the student there. Now, we're, we're improving that. So this year, we've got 2,000 of our students out of 40,000. We've got 2,000 signed up for entrepreneurship training and events and uh, we, we used to run physical events over weekends and start a company events and so on and from that we'll generate 100, 100 new companies every year. I, I'd love that to be you know five or six thousand and, and two or three hundred companies. Mm. It, it very much is uh, to quote the Mao phrase I think it is like you know let the thousand flowers bloom. Yes. Uh, you, you can't really decide uh, not, not that we're a Mao's university or anything. I think <laughs> but, um, I, you, yeah. you can't really pick who's going to be successful uh, you can't really pick that i, I mean i interestingly um karen Immergluck, uh, who's my opposite number at stanford i know very well and in fact she's just joining our board on edinburgh innovations uh, first board meetings tomorrow and the, at stanford they they took google around for years and years and years the idea of google and and people said to them ah who would be interested in ranking internet searches? That's never going to be successful. And she uses that just to explain to people that, you know, you can't pick winners a lot and you just can't pick winners. Um, yeah. So therefore, mm. to me, it's about quality, but it's about getting that volume up. And we have the, we have the quality. I mean, we've got 40,000 of the brightest people in the world coming through our university every year. We, we've got the quality there. We need to get the interest up. We need to go from 2,000 to 4,000, yeah. 5,000 to 6,000. Yeah. And we will generate, you know, 100 companies a year really fantastically. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's great. Well, listen, you've, you've both been so interesting. I've kind of run over my uh, own Q&A time that I usually give myself. And I've got a bundle of questions stacked up here. So I wonder, are you both okay to run on slightly past uh, 3 o'clock if, if we can just get through? Yeah, sure. Years? If uh, people are happy to. Yes, uh, that's yeah. great. Well, I'll start with uh, Nick Kunzberg because he was first. Actually, Nick, are you there? Thank you very much, Chris. Um, one comment and one question. Um, George, it's great to meet you. I sit in the selection panel for the RSE Enterprise Fellowships. And yeah, yeah. your name on Edinburgh Innovation. So it's <laughs> nice to see the man who. Oh, good to see you. I, I was really interested, Yarmo, when you mentioned the creative industries, because they're often yeah. forgotten about in this world. And of course, Finland has a phenomenal record, particularly in, in music. Um, but can you just explain how you, the EDI will impact creative industries other than the, the, the logistics side, the surrounding logistics? Is there something which actually... You, you can see hitting the, the creative processes. So yes, the uh, there's uh, maybe two two angles to that. Uh, uh, the uh, our one of the first DDR projects is the pro program called Creative Informatics, led by Professor Chris Speed, mm -hmm. and the Creative Informatics brings together uh, creative industry uh, practitioners and and, and artists and uh, data scientists, informaticians. And they, what they do uh, is, to, is to both develop or use AI and data as part of the, uh, you know, making literature, music, uh, visual arts, uh, but also then uh, support the uh, potential uh, creative industry practitioners as entrepreneurs who would uh, benefit from data and AI as part part of, of, of what they do. So there's an accelerator incubator program connected to it. And uh, and that's a domain which, of course, at the time of the pandemic, interestingly, that's one of the domains which has kind of thrived because we, we, we all spend our days looking at the screen. So uh, screen based media mixed mixed ways of doing things have become mainstream quite fast. 
uh, and uh, then on that li links to the logistical work which we are doing now with the festivals uh, trying to uh, pro program called smart places which we are running uh, this year uh, in which uh, uh, Chris Chris Pete and Chris Dent uh, his colleague from the uh, informatics are trying to help the festivals to to use data and AI to run safely next next year how, how do you for example provide uh, multi-location experiences how do you expand the uh, performances in uh, less clumsy ways uh, for for home viewing how do we manage uh, uh, transport and uh, people flows within city so that you could have a socially distanced festival with uh, some amount of people on site of course we still don't know whether that's doable but we do hope that the vaccination program would be at the stage where we can have some sort of festival not you know not a million people but still people in edinburgh but that has to be done in a way which is safe okay uh, i'll just move on so that we can get through um siobhan mithers are you there siobhan are you with us siobhan or have you left Siobhan might have gone. Ah, okay. Uh, Andrew McGee. Hopefully you're with us, Andrew. Chris, thank you very much. James, uh, John Moen and uh, George, what can you say regarding COP26 being in town uh, over the next 10 months? What, what are we doing? What can we do to use, uh, to demonstrate to the world how Scotland's leading on addressing some of the climate change challenges using AI and data in the most effective ways? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're... we're, we're... Obviously, as a university, we are heavily engaged. Uh, my own team, we are putting um, events together as part of that uh, that much larger event. So uh, the university is really committed to be playing a full part in that. Um, so on the broad innovation side, we are we are running innovation related events, networking sessions, you know, uh, displaying the technologies around the university as well. Um, and in fact, you know, we've got, uh, we call them communities of interest we set up. So we've got communities of interest around carbon uh, capture and storage, communities of interest around the hydrogen economy, which we're just getting kicked off, which we're hoping to showcase uh, later on in the year at, at COP26 as well. But um, Yarmo, I think, would, would know more about the, the DDI specifics. The, uh, yeah, we are, uh, I think there's uh, another angle to this, which is that the, uh, of course, uh, Data and AI have a, have a dirty secret uh, in a very uh, climate uh, hostile uh, way because the uh, increasing, very fast increasing uh, use of cloud based services and always on services is a massive spender of, uh, of energy. And uh, that's something we are very conscious of. And when we are building the uh, EIDF data facility, we are we are we are doing our best to make that as green as possible. So basically, recycling the uh, extra, uh, extra heat uh, for district district heating and uh, other other such such measures. But that's a domain in which the uh, I would say the data community of the world could do much more. And uh, we would ex would be keen to ex explore the uh, opportunities for partnership in in that domain. How do we do data and AI sustainably? Not just use that for sustainability, but also do the thing itself in a more sustainable way. That currently always is the case. Okay, next question, uh, Gordon McLeod. Are you with us, Gordon? Yes, thanks. I mean, I, I was just kind of agreeing with Yarmo that, that one of the things we're not so good at, I agree with lots of the strengths, one of the things we're maybe not as good at is the link between university and uh, industry. And uh, wondered on what suggestions mm. drive that going forwards. I mean, I can pick up the general point if you want. So and that's uh, that's one of the. Uh, yeah, yeah. You go, yeah, so I, I can address that from the quick from the DDI viewpoint. The uh, we do have a uh, the adoption target target of a thousand companies and organisations we would work with uh, in in DDI. So it's a quite a quite a ambitious and ambitious target. Uh, the uh, in our case, the way we have approached this in in these early days is to is to secure large scale key anchor projects, which are always uh, public private initiatives. So the Global Open Finance Center of Excellence collaborates with financial institutions. DataLog expects to collaborate with with also healthcare sector companies. ACRC is a collaboration with uh, legal and general, etc. So we are starting. Uh, 
with those, uh, but then we do expect that the adaption work should be also available for, for SMEs, for, for small and medium-sized companies who often are struggling to benefit from this this domain and uh, we we build we will build the uh, adoption collaboration programs in these domains on, on, on the more but george of course does oh, yeah, a lot of this is, is good, yeah, i mean on a more general point there's, 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 no i think i think we've made a good point you know we, we always say that in britain that we're not very good at working in the industry and, to, and i think historically that's probably been correct uh, i mean i've been 10 years in university now i've seen it from the other side of the fence i used to do university contracts when i worked for astrazeneca so i saw probably more in the bad old days of what it used to be like. It, it's improved dramatically. If you look, just to throw in some numbers, the, the total value of commercial contracts, the sort of work that, that I get engaged with from British universities last year with industry was about 5.1 billion pounds, right? That's been growing at about 5% a year for the last 10 years. So really strong growth. Of that, we did about 180 million as Edinburgh. So that's that's I think that's a pretty big chunk, you know, for a for a, 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 a university like us. I think the issue we've always had in Scotland is that we don't have as research intensive an, an industry base as other bits of even the UK. So probably second last in the scale behind the northeast. Um, you know, we uh, actually the biggest chunk of research gets done in in Scotland is done in the universities, not necessarily in the private sector. Whereas if you go to London and the southeast, that's reversed. You know, the private sector does mm. uh, the largest share, even though they have, you know, big universities like Oxford, Cambridge, uh, uh, UCL, and Imperial, and so on. So we, we have that to do. We're trying to build that. We have to build that in Scotland. And a part of our commitment to that is that we actually host Interface, which is the Scottish Government, Scottish Funding Council, HIESE funded um, organization, which looks at university and SME engagement. And that's been growing very rapidly in the last five or six years as well. Uh, so we host that within Edinburgh Innovations, and that's part of our commitment to help the growth in SMEs and help them connect to universities. There's a very strong correlation uh, in all the academic literature. Um, if you look at people who work with the universities and growth rates, um, so we, we have to do our bit to make ourselves available for that. You know, it is growing. We, we, since I joined, we've more than doubled our commercial outputs. We've more than doubled our income from, from industry. Uh, our income from industry is now about 15% of our total research income. And, and I'd like to get up to about 25 or 30, if I could, um, which is yeah. would be UK leading. Strathclyde, for example, is at 25%. So we are a bit behind that, but we're a very different type of university. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, Maybe... Maybe one point to that, uh, yeah. because it was a, Gordon, it was an interesting question, and from just from the, from the data and digital point of view, or actually data point of view, I think that there would be also opportunities uh, in in the increasing the digital and data competencies of companies, so that they understand better the the opportunity possibilities of that, and uh, we done the. Uh, few first uh, attempts to that, for example, through a non-executive uh, director uh, programs in which we have, uh, together with the uh, FW Park Brown, we've injected a data element in NXD education with the, uh, with the business school. That's something which obviously works and something which I think we could do much more at scale, really, uh, so that we we ensure there's understanding uh, about the opportunities of new technologies and data uh, at the director level in companies. And, and, and sorry, can I just can I just jump in and say very one quick thing. The biggest impact the British universities have on industry is our graduates. And everybody forgets that, you know, I, I'm really proud of the work mm. that we do in terms of <laughs> academic interaction with companies. The biggest impact we have is that we produce absolutely fantastic graduates. And, and so we forget that sometimes. And I think industry forgets that some things. That's the most important thing that we do, teach and train absolutely brilliant people. Um, and, and if you look at the numbers, the impact of that is many times more than every other bit of impact universities have. For me, it's always been a fantastic investment to get involved in MSc projects and summer students and all the rest. You know, they've always paid back yes. their Yes. Early yes. engagement. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, thank you. <laughs> all right, well, just another another couple of questions and then, then we'll be done. Um, Alison Payne. Thanks. Um, it's been really fascinating listening to everything you've got to say, but it's also um, 
almost a bit of glimmer of hope. In the middle of the pandemic and most of the economic development stories we're hearing at the moment, we've got traditionally strong industries that are struggling because they can't operate. We've got other industries that are all, we're already struggling and are being pulled under. So to hear about a sector that is succeeding, succeeding in Scotland and growing, my question is then that, you know, how can the government help help that succeed more? How can we spread that growth? Um, what policies would you like the Scottish government to, to invoke that would help, help, help you grow even further? Very good. Uh, <laughs> do I give it a punt and then we'll see what, uh, you, 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 what, 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 how you could build on that, George? The, uh, I think the work which the, uh, has been done on the uh, Scottish national, national data and AI strategy is uh, that's, that's, that's been that's been excellent. Uh, I mean, it still hasn't quite been finally signed off, but that's that's something which should be endorsed. Uh, in the context of uh, of policies, uh, data strategy should be then turned into data policies, and uh, and also increasing awareness of uh, importance of data data capabilities across public public and and private sectors. And uh, for example understanding of the value of data and especially the fact that that uh, data is is uh, most valuable when it's shared so the uh, that's something uh, if i pull an example from a completely different landscape which is london i'm a member of the smart london board and in uh, in there the city of london is working with the boroughs to very consciously to build into a tech landscape where the data ownership and data sharing capacity in every service which London is invo involved in remains with the city. So service providers are private sector organizations, they can they, they work with the city, but data can be always pulled out, reused, put into other use. So uh, understanding the data as, as, as capital, but not capital you hoard, capital you use and you use together with others, that, that's where the uh, sort of uh, that's the uh, golden golden eggs laying goose is when 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 you when we learn to do that that efficiently because that can be uh, used across any domains we we can't know which data we might want to connect in the future if we build capacity to do that that's 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 going to be valuable yeah i i i'll give you two very i think oh, you yeah, know maybe uh, practical examples so one, one would be um, the Scottish government supports us, uh, innovation gives us a grant every year to help us uh, support innovation in the university, which we're very grateful for. Um, but if, if, I was, if I was working in an English university, it'd be about three times that amount of money. The, the English system actually gives that innovation grant is much higher than it is in Scotland. So of course I would, and I've said this to SFC, I'm not speaking out of turn here. We have very friendly discussions about this all the time. And they, you know, and SFC will make a case for all the bits of their support being better in Scotland than it is in England. Mm. So, but, and, and so just speaking from my point of view is uh, I get, you know, a million and a half a year from SFC to support um, the, the, what we've done at Edinburgh. That doesn't pay for, for, for my team. I've got 120 people. Uh, the university fortunately has uh, supported me over the last five years with its, with with funding, and we now generate a surplus to the university, which is great. So we pay for ourselves. So I, I, of course, I would say, well, just just bring the funding levels up to where it would be if I was in Manchester, and that would really help. <laughs> uh, I think the other thing that which I think we can do uh, as as a university is uh, I'm really fortunate having that large group of people. You know, I've got people that can specialise in different areas. So I've got eight or nine people who specialise in patents and licences and so on. And I think some of the smaller universities in Scotland don't have sufficient resources to be able to have that type of specialty. Um, so I, I'm always up for a discussion with them about um, can we pool that ability for the benefit of the whole country? You know, can, can we actually say to the SFC and the Scottish Government, why yeah. don't we have a separate Scottish service for some parts of that? For... for maybe the the apart from the four biggest or five biggest who can do it themselves it really would help the other universities who've who've got some really fantastic offering but they may not have the resources to be able to support even one specialist in in licensing or patents so um i think that's something that would be good for the country uh, and try and pull pull our resources there in that one 
Okay, well, let's, we'll just have one last question. I'm not going to get to everyone, and I'm sorry, because there are some good questions, but... Um, can, but I, can I get 30 seconds on top of that? Sorry. Always, always, yeah. Sorry, on. just on the previous topic, because I have forgotten that uh, key, key, key thing. Just, just very, very quickly, the, uh, the skills side. So the, uh, as a separate part of DDI, we also run a DDI skills gateway. And uh, within the DDI skills gateway, we work at schools with the data skills, skills at schools program which has been a fantastic success in the first few schools where we ran it. And uh, that's, of course, where the future founders are. Is if we, if and when we are able to work with uh, people of all ages, building the capacity for the nation, you know, from school kids to reskilling and upskilling workforce. And to do that at much larger scale than we currently are doing, rethinking the uh, curriculum of our, of our schools. Okay, that was a point worth making. Thank you. Um, right, last question from Derek Young, which gets us back into the meat of this conversation, I think, and is probably a good one to, to end on. Derek, are you with us? Yes, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can, yep. yep. Super, thanks, Chris. Um, I was intrigued, during the earlier discussion, we heard about um, specialism within AI. The potential is so vast that you can develop niche specialisms um, and so my, my thought was, does it make sense for Scotland, we've already identified certain areas of our economy that are thought to be sort of key growth areas like um, financial services, life sciences, renewables, these things. Would it make sense to invest our efforts and our attention on AI and enhancing these things for competitive advantage? Or, alternatively, do we get a more kind of balanced, well-functioning, effective society by trying to address some of our sort of well-worn, understood challenges like diet, lifestyle factors, national confidence, mm -hmm. aging population infrastructure? Is it even the right way to think about these things, to think about a dichotomy between those two choices? Or could you do a kind of rising tide lifts all boats mm -hmm. um, and try to accomplish both at once? Great question. That's a great question. I mean, for us, it's a great question. I mean, for us, there's a real balance there. You know, we're, uh, you know, working in a university and having been an academic, you know, the idea that you could go and tell our academics what they're going to be working on for the next 10 years, it doesn't really work like that. Uh, um, you know, but we do have expertise in certain areas and the university is, is having a very active discussion about the, the sort of four or five themes that we want to be perceived to be absolutely world class at. I mean, we, we would argue we're world class at a lot of things and, and you know, world top 20 university we should be, but but really, really top uh, on. So we're coming to that sort of conclusion and actually they, they pretty much overlap with the, the themes that you, that you mentioned there about what, what the Scottish economy should be focusing on as well. So I, I think there is, and I've seen that in other universities that where you actually go publicly and you say, here are the four or five areas that we are really going to focus on in research and, and innovation. It, it helps the whole university because it boosts your impact, it boosts your reputation around the whole world for uh, across every, every area. So, um, so my, my personal view, having seen it being done at other universities, is I'm a big supporter of having themes that everybody can get behind. And the themes can't be so broad that everybody gets <laughs> included because that just becomes a bit of a nonsense. But um, I mean, we've been talking about, you know, one health, you know, animal human health, zoonotic diseases, absolutely, you know, right at the heart of everything at the moment. Um, you know, data-driven innovation being absolutely the heart of what we do as well. So, so all of these things that we're looking at as an international university that we are really strong in research at, it, we can feed into the, the mm. Scottish priorities as well. Um, and, and fortunately, there's a good overlap. If you look at where we get most of our industrial funding um, over the last 20 years, it's come in the life sciences and communications technology. Um, and uh, that, those are our two biggest sectors. Um, and it's, it's where we do most of our spin-outs and startups as well. Mm. So there's a really good overlap in what the Scottish government would see as priorities as well. Mm. Okay. Yarmouth, I could... Yeah. Uh, Continue on that by saying, I take us home. So, I think the uh, first of all, I, I do think the dichotomy isn't the right way to look at that, and that's because the I don't think the uh, I agree with the need to focus on key sectors, but I don't think that's in contradiction with also the latter part of your question, which is to try to tackle the wicked problems of the society, sort of the inbuilt uh, challenges of the society through data and, and AI. 
as well. So I, I, I don't think those are in contradiction because the uh, former uh, is uh, is a sector-based, more industrial driven strategy. The latter is the uh, ability to use new novel ways of uh, in innovating in data to tackle some of the uh, very uh, hard-grained problems of the society at large. And I think those two can live side by side and the, uh, they will bo both feed to the increasing the efficiency of the nation. That's fundamentally what it's all about. Okay. Well, thank you I, uh, for an absolutely fascinating event. That was stimulating and educational uh, and, and just, just a load of really, really interesting stuff. And, uh, you know, I think it's incredibly impressive to speak to the two of you right at the cutting edge of a lot of this stuff which is changing our lives and will change our lives further and, and to you know to see how deeply engaged you are and, and thoughtful about not just the practicalities but the ethics and everything else is, uh, is is rewarding so hopefully in Scotland we will build on all of this and and get, uh, you know advance uh, in, in positive ways into the future so uh, just for everyone on behalf of everyone I'd like to thank again Yarmo and George for taking the time to share that with us I know you're, you're busy guys and um, thanks again to everyone who's attended thanks for your questions uh, there should be a recording of this available on the website probably early next week if Catherine's managed to record it properly uh, and uh, we have a number of equally exciting events coming up over the, the next few months so uh, keep your eyes on your email uh, inbox and and stick with us and uh, we'll, we'll keep these great conversations going so thank you again to our guests and to our audience and uh, we'll see you soon thank you well, thanks for the invite thanks thank for, you very much for being part. Thank you. thanks thank thanks you. for the opportunity yeah thank bye, -bye. You. It was a pleasure. bye now